believe in ghosts? Do you? The townspeople of Stokes Headington gave the passing of Clay Trevor little concern or gossip. Whatever happened to the Trevor family was of little moment to Stokes Headington. The three oddly assorted occupants of Trevor Mance had lived their lives so isolated from the affairs of the English village that the town took the rare comings and goings of the hawk-like Clay Trevor, the stockier, bull-like Gordon Trevor, and the forbidding, angular Jane Trevor as matters of no personal concern. The two brothers and the sisters had lived aloof from the village since the death of their father and mother some 20 years before. They had lived entirely to themselves. No one knew or cared how amicably on the handsome income that old Samuel Trevor was reported to have left them. They had lived within the confines of the old gray stone manor until the late 50s and early 60s had overtaken the three of them, just as the green moss had grown brown and sear around the crevices of the manse. Old Tatum, the housekeeper, entered Miss Jane's bedroom the morning after Clay Trevor's burial. Your tea, Miss Jane? Tea, Tatum? Jane Trevor lifted her narrow white head. I will have my tea in the dining room as usual. Oh, I thought as how after all you'd been through, you'd like to lie abed a bit, Mum. Not at all, Tatum. Breakfast will be as usual in the dining room. My brother is dead. We won't refer to it again. The household will go on as usual. Is Mr. Gordon down yet? Breakfast was as usual, Jane thought. Gordon had taken Clay's place at the head of the table. Otherwise, things were identical with the mornings of 20 years. As Tatum removed the plates, Gordon rose and with his customary, pardon me, Jane, started to leave the room. You're spending the day in Clay's library again? Why do you lock it? I would appreciate your leaving my affairs to me, Jane. Clay's library is now mine. Kindly see that I'm not disturbed. Tatum paused in lifting the teapot. Mr. Gordon, don't look so well, Miss Jane. I think he's quite as usual. I thought I heard him about in the night, Mum. That will do, Tatum. Here is the list for the tradespeople. Throughout the day, Gordon kept to the library with the door locked. At tea time, he emerged took his tea and muffins in silence, and then retired to the library. Jane heard the dull turning of the key in the lock. How like Gordon. How like her life. A lock turning against her, always shut away like all the Trevors. Individual prisons, all of them. No warmth, no friendships, no contacts, only austerity and loneliness. Later, much later that night, Jane woke to a sound she knew she had felt beat a rhythm in her dreams for a long while. In the lower hall, the great clock was striking midnight, but that was not the sound that had wakened her. Somewhere in the house, there was a dull thudding. It broke and came again, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. For an instant, fear struck through her Trevor calm. Then she rose, wrapped herself in a robe, slipped out of her room and down the stairs. At the foot of the stairs, she paused. The big hall was dark, cold, and very still. There was not one ray of light anywhere. Then the sound again. It came from the library. Gordon, he couldn't have gone to bed. Should she call? No, no, she'd listen. Even pressed against the library door, she couldn't decide what he was doing. His voice, he was muttering something. What was he saying? Go away, go away. What are you doing here? You're, you're... Dead. No, no. This is my room now. My desk. 
I'll strike you down with this cane. Ah! Again, the sharp thuds. No, no. Ah. I'll move this lamp. There. Ah. Still there, eh? Oh, get out, I tell you. You're, you're dead, Clay Trevor. You can't come back. You never can be here again with your beetling eyebrows, your gloomy face, keeping me shut in this ghastly prison. Uh, drink. <laughs> drink, if you want to. Drink it down. Uh, go away, Clay. Please, please go away, Clay. Every night since you died, you taunted me in life. You taunt me in death. You needn't beckon to me. I'm not going with you. I tell you, I'm not. I'm not. Outside the door, Jane was very cold. Gordon. There was no answer. Then Jane Trevor shrugged closer into her robe and crept back up the stairs to her icy room. The next morning at breakfast, Gordon coldly informed Jane he was leaving for London. Jane raised her eyebrows. And you will return when? I don't know. I shall see the family barrister in London and arrange a settlement of Clay's share of the estate. Perhaps later I shall sell it all out. I hate Stokes Headington. I hate this house. I shall be very glad to be free of it all. And he left the room. Jane, used to long days, used to empty days, found this day longer and emptier than any she ever had known. Not well, thought Jane. Not myself. My heart again, perhaps. I'll take one of my powders. The small gray apothecary's box was not in its accustomed place nor any of the other places that Jane looked. Tatum again. She must discipline Tatum for that. They were dangerous in overdoses. They mustn't be left about. She passed the library door. Something impelled her to stop, and again the strange happenings of the night before came to her mind. She tried the door. It opened. It was a musty room, unaired, Damp, the earthy odor of mildew, moldy book bindings, cold ashes, old upholstery, and a faint overtone of Clay's old meerschaum. She crossed to the great smoke-stained fireplace to set a match to some loose papers. One of the hearthstones moved under her step. Loose, it must be repaired. She edged it up with the toe of her slipper. It fell away and revealed a small, light object. She picked it up. Why? Her medicine box. The box the apothecary so carefully had labeled poison. Jane dropped the box as though it burned her and groped her way back to the chair beside Clay's desk. She sat staring at the fireplace, oddly shaken. The room was lighted only by the faint, rays of the afternoon that filtered through the closely drawn hangings. What was that strange darkness on the wall? A stain? No. A shadow. It seemed to move. It was taking shape. A forbidding shape. The shape of a man. She looked hastily about her. No. No, there was no one else in the room. She turned back. It was the shadow of a man. A tall, thin man. Stooped. Hawk face. Beetling brows. Clay! My nerves playing me tricks again. She flung the curtains apart at the window and let the waning light flood the room. But the shadow was still there. It seemed to be beckoning. And trembling, Jane went closer. The bony forefinger, Clay's forefinger that so many times had been pointed in ridicule at Gordon and Jane, 
seem to be pointing, pointing at something on the mantel. Why, it was the decanter, Clay's old decanter that always had been kept filled against his nightcap. Empty now. Jane remembered Gordon had poured out the brandy the morning Clay was found dead. Again, the bony forefinger was pointing, this time lower, toward the hearth. And again, Jane followed it with her eyes and saw the tiny gray apothecary's box labeled poison. Jane sank back into the chair, her body bathed in icy coldness. Clay, Clay, his shadow, awful, ominous, hanging there over her. What did it mean? Why didn't it go? Clay was gone. What was it waiting for? It was moving again, stepping back. Her staring eyes followed it. What was that? Something else, black, silent, taking shape there on the wall. Another shadow. Shorter, thicker, hands raised as if to ward off a blow. Gordon's shadow. The taller shadow beckoned to the shorter. And as Jane watched them, spellbound with horror, they began to grow dimmer and dimmer until they faded out together. So, that was why Clay had waited. There was a sound of voices at the front door, and Tatum entered the library. It's a telegram from London for you, Miss Jane. Yes. Yes, I know. Tatum, tomorrow we tear this room to pieces. I want to sell everything in it. But, Mr. Gordon, Mum, what'll he say when he comes back? It's quite all right, Tatum. Mr. Gordon won't be back ever. Mr. Gordon is dead. Do you believe in ghosts? 